So one thing I know from the outset, and that is that I'm going to safely assume most of you, if not all of you here, are not Seattle fans, because if you were, you'd be sitting at home right now moping, rather than coming along to lecture. We're moping. You're moping. So you're coming here hoping that I will pick you up a little bit. Okay. Let me, let me begin by taking this immediate opportunity of saying what a privilege it is to be joined with all of you here this evening in Vancouver, and especially with Rabbi and Revitzen Weinberg, senior and junior, and Chabad of Vancouver, which does obviously so much beautiful work for the benefit of the wider community, a real source of blessing for the many of you, and a real source of inspiration for myself and many others besides me. Then I'm sure you all join with me in extending to them only continued blessings and success in all of their endeavors. As a proud native Canadian, and that wasn't included in my warm introduction, and thank you, Rabbi Schneer, for that introduction, I am originally from Toronto, Canada, but I have to tell you that I never quite made it to the west coast of Canada, though I'm sure that perhaps more of you made it over onto the east coast. And it's true, I mean, when I was younger, we used to turn around to my parents and we used to say, you know, why don't we ever travel to the west coast of Canada? We were always told it's the more beautiful part of the country, the warmer part of the country, etc. And when I asked my parents the question, I was given the simple answer, are you kidding? It's so far away, it's further than you think, it's the other side of the country, it's so expensive. So last week I'm on the phone with my very wonderful and Jewish mother and I said to her, you know, I'm going to be traveling. She says, so you're in Canada and you're not even stopping in Toronto to say hello? <laughs> and I'm like, but Ma, you know, I, I'm not exactly around the corner. She says, what are you talking about? It's not exactly all that far away. It doesn't even cost so much to be able to stop in Toronto. And that's the way it goes with Jewish mothers, right? You can't live with them, you can't live without them, but you've always got to love them. <laughs> and let me just add this. And I say this with absolute sincerity and true conviction. Isn't it wonderful to belong to a country whose government is probably the only real and true friend of Israel anywhere in the world? So in order to discuss the topic of this evening, the challenge of the Jew in the 21st century, I think maybe first and foremost we have to analyze the definition of a Jew, because only when you define what you are can you then come to better grips and readily identify the particular challenges that sometimes confront or test that uniqueness or sense of individuality. So, the first question, does being Jewish mean belonging to a particular race? And the obvious and immediate answer is that there is no such a thing as a Jewish race, because race denotes a biological distinction, common ancestry and so on. But there are, of course, Jews of every single race and color. There are black Jews, there are white Jews. There are Oriental Jews and Occidental Jews. Descendants of every conceivable race have joined the Jewish people over the course of history through the ages, being universally recognized as Jews. So race, Judaism is not. Maybe the definition of Jew then is something to do with national identity. And yet here again, I suggest to you that nationality can hardly be a definition for a people that have been dispersed throughout much of the world for more than 2,000 years without any country and without any <coughs> homeland of its own. For two-thirds of its actual existence, the Jewish people have been dispersed throughout so many different places without any nationalistic identification. We are, whether we're amongst the Egyptians or the Babylonians or the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Arabs, Germany, Poland, France, and so on and so forth. Jewish people, moreover, have been joined by thousands of men and women, none of whose ancestry had ever stepped foot in the ancient land of Israel. So to define Jewishness as a nationality is historically untenable. On balance, to be a Jew means simply this. It's to be part of a faith, to be part of a religion, to be part of a people. Only, of course, once you use the term religion, you invariably bring God into the equation. And once you bring God into the equation, then you have to understand that there's no such a thing as an exclusive 
belief in God without determining what it is that God wants from me. Once we talk about religion, then to choose or to accept a religion means to accept for oneself a special way of life. The very definition of religion means intellectual and emotional conviction, a profound conviction of what the believer perceives as absolute reality, the ultimate values of life, the ultimate truth, ultimate reality. And religion, by definition, therefore, also necessitates that we approach life in a more theocratic rather than democratic way. Religion, by its very definition, means that God and He alone initiates and defines religion and revelation. God and He alone determines what is acceptable and what is not in life. Only God Himself can state and define what conforms to His will, that there has to be some kind of mandate, something that helps us better define our role and our responsibility. That is the definition of a Jew. That is the definition of religion, which effectively is what Judaism is. So therefore, that then begs the next question, what is our responsibility? And for that, as Judaism is based on the public revelation at Sinai, when the Torah was first given to Israel, the mandate by which God defined what it is that he wants from us to do here in this world, when we were first proclaimed as a Jewish people, as a Jewish nation, then we need to look back to what happened at that all initial, all defining event. And it is in fact what we will be reading this coming Shabbat in the Torah. God spoke the Ten Commandments more than 3,000 years ago. There was this tremendous explosion, you might call it a theophany. Thunder, lightning, all this music and magic, the ultimate light show, if you will. And each of our ancestors was there personally taking in the spiritual impact of the event. Indeed, Judaism is the only religion that lays claim to the notion of a national revelation, which makes it as tenable as any other historical claim. No other religion makes that claim because it's too fantastic a phenomena to fabricate. Either it did or it didn't happen. And as we all stood there, it wasn't just our ancestors, but indeed Jewish tradition, mysticism, tells us that every soul of every Jew that would ultimately emerge through the course of history was also every bit present at that earliest moment in time, integrating that divine event as an integral part of our Jewish essence. The question then is this, and let's pause to consider. What was the all-defining characteristic in this mass revelation as it took place? Is it the fact that God spoke, or is it the message that God gave us? It would seem to me that the very revelation itself was more integral to the event. Because you see, if you take one away from the other, what would be the more important aspect? Is it the fact that God spoke to us, but not necessarily knowing the content, or having the content, but not necessarily knowing that it came from God? As a people, is it more important that we have a very interesting message, or is it the fact that God spoke to us as a people, which then gives credence and validity to everything else which then becomes subsequently taught in every dimension of our religion. Let's in fact consider the opening verse of the Ten Commandments, which tells us, and God spoke, et kol hadvarim all these words say. The simple question. No word in the Torah is superfluous. Nothing is redundant. What it should have simply said was, and God said, boom, and then carry on with the Ten Commandments. Why does it introduce the Ten Commandments with, and God spoke all these words? And the commentaries explain that in the first instance, God spoke all the many words of the Ten Commandments as though like it was one word, something that we can't possibly fathom. We can't conceive that sort of idea, but that's what the Jews at that moment in time experienced. And then, of course, thereafter, God articulated the Ten Commandments word by word as he relayed them over again to the Jewish people. But that begs an obvious question. Insofar as we are mortal beings confined to human limitations, if all the words spoken are being said as one word, 
then there's no way we're going to be able to hear and accept the message. We wouldn't have been capable of absorbing what was being said. I mean, if, if all of you over here would start speaking to me all at one time, I'd never be able to understand what any of you were saying. So what is the point of God in the first instance saying all of the Ten Commandments like one word if there's no way that we could possibly conceive this? And yet the point is, what is obvious is that it wasn't in the first instance about hearing the detail. That is something that could happen later. In the first instance, it was all about God doing what only God can do. So that we then standing there could embrace the enormity of the very real experience. God speaking to the people. That was enough in order to make the necessary initial impact and impression on the masses. But of course, that was only the first step. Afterwards, the Torah tells us that then God related the Ten Commandments in its detail, and then thereafter, as we will be reading this weekend, the Torah says that the entire people saw the sounds and the flames and the sound of the shofar, and the mountain is full of smoke, all of this, again, great, unbelievable experience, and then it adds, and they began to move away. Every person there was aware that they just experienced something miraculous. They had this colossal religious experience. But here's the problem. Have you ever stopped to consider what it would be like if God spoke to you? How would you feel? On the first instance, you'd right away assume that it must be a tantalizing experience. Only that thereafter, you'd suddenly pause and think to yourself, did that really just happen, or did I undergo a psychotic episode and I need to go get help? And therein lies the point. The experience in itself could be so overwhelming that it might even prove to be counterproductive. The Jewish people at Sinai, they experienced God. And what was the response? They back up. And they turn to Moses and they say, you speak to us, you relay the rest to us. Don't let God speak to us, lest we will die. Moses, from his part, he pleads with them. He tells them, don't be afraid. God wants to elevate you so that the awe, the reverence, the fear of God can be internalized within you and elevate you so that you will then never come to sin. And nonetheless, the Torah again reiterates that the people move away and you might say that a certain opportunity then and there becomes missed. You see, in the first instance, God wanted the people to know this is real. It was more about the revelation than the content that the people experienced. Thereafter, he also then wanted to speak to them. He welcomed them to meet him. He encouraged them to come in and to hear the detail. And that was an opportunity that the people missed as they pulled back. Moses pleads with them, listen, hear God, so you won't come to sin, not because that's going to impede their free choice, but when you hear it directly from God, it penetrates that much deeper into your own psyche so that you'll be less inclined to come to sin. And nevertheless, they find this too overwhelming. They were afraid. And we know how many days later they end up making a golden calf and whatever else besides. You might sum up that whole initial revelation and experience with which we began as a Jewish nation in the following simple words. <coughs> they embraced the bigger picture, but they shied away from the detail. And the amazing thing is that, that from that earliest point in time until present day, there are Jews, wonderful Jews, who love the big picture of Judaism, but they get frustrated, some might say maybe even fearful, when it comes to the details. You know, you can walk into a room and you can be immediately struck by the beauty of a Picasso or a Rembrandt. But it is the one who truly understands art and scrutinizes the picture in all of its intricate detail in order to be able to better reach into the mind of the artist, to connect to the artist and really appreciate what is happening, what is being conveyed, what the artist is looking to communicate through his canvas. Conversely, there may be others in our world today who are 
punctilious in their observance of the detail of the Torah, stuck in every bit and every letter of the law, but they ignore the bigger picture. Our world today readily attests to what happens to people who are stuck in the letter of the law but ignore the spirit of the law. You can have people who are scrupulous in their observance, they adhere to every fine detail, but what at what expense? What about the bigger picture of Yiddishkeit and all that it represents? What is the bigger picture of Judaism? The big picture of Judaism is Jewish pride, Jewish identity, all the sort of things that we all typically associate with when we look to connect in a bigger and broader sense to our faith, to our religion. The detail, of course, is the nitty gritty, the detail, the intricate necessity of observance, the mitzvot, and all the different responsibilities incumbent upon us as Jewish individuals. And therein lies the point. At Sinai, they embraced the bigger picture, they shied away from the detail. All through the course of history, that's the balance, that's the struggle that we go through. And our first and foremost responsibility is to embrace the bigger picture. And if you're scared of the detail, go explore, discover, find out what that detail is and what it does for you as a Jew. And if you're only stuck in the detail and you're ignoring the bigger picture, you must come to understand and appreciate that the detail itself is only really there to make up the beautiful mosaic that is the bigger picture. And it's precisely when you find how you're able to embrace both elements that you come to find true fulfillment as a Jew in life. So that's just by way of introduction. I think that our world today, in the 21st century, is teetering on the brink. The problem that we, as Jewish people, face in the 21st century is twofold. We face two threats. There is an external threat, and there is an internal threat. From an external perspective, there is what we encounter today as the very real threat of anti-Semitism as it rears its ugly head yet again. Not a week goes by without reading in a paper about one attack or another. And most of these stories, sadly, have become so commonplace, they get, they get relegated to a few inches of column space in whichever sort of paper. And to be sure, yes, credit has to be granted to the many different governments, certainly in Europe and no doubt beyond, that have prioritized legislation now against what is termed as race hate crimes. It makes people maybe think twice before they might choose to express their racial sentiment. But what does legislation really do apart from suppress something rather than really eradicate it? I mean, racism is not some virus like polio that can be eradicated with legislative and social medicine. You know, I don't have to make the point to you. Everyone knows this enough to be true when you look into your own heart. Prejudice is one of the principal constituents of the human personality. So the question is, to what extent can society genuinely control what can only be described as irrational hatred? The tragic reality is that racism, xenophobia, and anti-Semitism above all else is not dead by any stretch of the imagination. More like sleeping dogs just waiting for an opportunity whenever it presents itself. But that's the problem. The real challenge is, what are we as Jewish people supposed to do about it? Some argue that maybe it's just better to blend, to go with the flow, to keep a low profile. It has become almost acceptable norm, certainly in parts of Europe, where Jews are now encouraged to not necessarily wear their kippah on the streets and whatever else besides. Kippah-clad youngsters are encouraged by rabbis at their pulpits to exchange their yarmulkes for baseball caps and what have you. And yet I suggest to you that when we revert to that sort of approach, to what the famous author Israel Zangwill once described as the ghetto stoop, walking with our heads down, keeping below the radar, then we are feeding into the stereotype. We're nurturing the germ, we're scoring our own goal. Because if the whole point and the whole purpose of anti-Semitism is to reduce the Jewish people into oblivion, then surely we are accommodating the process when we choose to lie low as it were. I do 
as Rabbi Weinberg said by way of introduction, some work with the BBC on some panel with any questions, etc., on a Sunday morning. And I got to know a guy over there by the name of Charles. Charles is a Jew who attends to his Chabad house on a very regular basis. And Charles once told me the story about how years ago he used to work for a different television company called ITV. And there was a very famous news anchorman, a black news anchorman by the name of Trevor McDonald. Today, Sir Trevor McDonald already retired. Probably in his time, the most famous news anchorman in the UK. And Charles once met Trevor McDonald, of all places, in the men's room. And Trevor turned to him and said to him, you're the guy from upstairs. And he says, yeah, that's right. He says, I've got to ask you a question. I come here early, you come here early. I see you sometimes pulling up in your car, you take your cap off your head, you put it in your pocket. Can I ask you why? And he says, well, yeah, I go to my prayers, as he did regularly at his Chabad house. He says, then I drive myself over here, and, you know, then I put it away because I'm coming into the building and I don't want to stand out, I don't want to look different. And Trevor McDonald looked to him, square in the eyes, and he said to him, do you know, and again, this is many years ago, he says, do you know that I am the only black man in this building apart from the cleaner? How do you think that makes me feel? Every time I walk into the boardroom, I immediately sense my difference. How do you think that makes me feel? And then he looked to Charles square in the eyes and he pinched the color of the skin of his cheek and he said, you see this? This is who I am. It doesn't wash off. <coughs> Compelling words, powerful words that demonstrate the point that the forceful, most powerful response, in fact, indeed, the only response to any kind of threat that might linger out there is to walk with your head held high, always an appreciation of who you are and what you stand for, realizing and understanding that it never washes off. And remember, it's only when you respect yourself that others will ensure to respect you as well. You know, people mistakenly assume that when you take too much pride in your own identity, when you're too overtly Jewish or whatever else, that's counterproductive to a society that looks to homogenize all group types into one broad mix. Kind of reminds me of a rabbi I know in Manchester who was one standing outside his shoal. He only had eight, <clears throat> plus himself nine. They needed one more for a minion. And he's standing out there in his talus and filling on a cold winter day. His tits is flaying in the wind, and he's watching as people go by, and he stops one particular guy, and he says, no, next, next. And one guy suddenly stops him and says to him, what's the matter with you? Why are you standing out here like that, in that garb? Aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What's it, what? And the rabbi looks at him and goes, ah, you're the one I'm looking for. Please come inside. You're number two. <laughs> There's nothing wrong to have pride in your own nationality and heritage. Nothing. Englishmen, Germans, Americans, French, Jews, and Muslims, every one of them has a heritage. And there is a certain virtue, of course, to be subjective about your heritage. Which Jew isn't proud of their own ancestry? In fact, I say to you that in order to be a genuine pious and fervent follower of any religion, you have to believe that you are in possession of an absolute truth that has an advantage over all other religions. Otherwise, frankly, you have no business laying claim to believing it in the first instance. You have no business to claim to adhere to it with all your heart and soul. The only problem is when it spills over and it gets to a point of excess, when it's no longer about being proud of your own ancestry, but turns into a lack of respect of others. And I suggest to you that the biggest problem is that society as a whole doesn't even know, doesn't really know what Judaism stands for. For some, it's about world dominance. After all, we talk about Mashiach, we talk about universal salvation. We speak about universal laws. Historically, this already was interpreted as though we're looking to try and make the world ours. In fact, you know, it's part of basic Jewish responsibility to teach the world about the seven Noahide laws, 
but at an earlier point in time, it was deliberately omitted from code of Jewish law because at that point in history, had it been included, it would have been misconstrued in the same sort of way as though we're trying to convert the world into making them Jews. For other Jews, Judaism, for other people rather, Judaism is, if not supremacy, then surely superiority, the chosen people complex. Who do we really think we are? And for others still, the sum total of Judaism is inextricably linked with Israel, which is why whatever happens there spills over everywhere else in the diaspora as well. And then they'll have you believe that anti-Zionism has nothing to do with anti-Semitism. The tragic irony is that Judaism is the only faith that insists that you have purpose as you are. It is the only faith that doesn't look to proselytize to try and make the rest of the world ours. It is the only faith that insists that you are as God created you and you can find true meaning in that role. Unlike other faiths that insist that the only way to heaven is but through them, Judaism says you hold the ticket to heaven in your hands by virtue of who you are. What do we mean by chosen nation? Well, if we're to fulfill that time-hallowed purpose of being a light onto the nations in the words of the prophet, that means that our foremost objective is to reveal the unity of God within a modern-day fragmented society. Judaism is the only faith that was formed because we were given the most crucial charge that humanity has ever been given, and that is to represent to humanity the central point of what makes a human being and how every individual, regardless, can achieve purpose in life. Probably you may have heard the story about the traveling salesman. Jewish guy made a deliberate point. Wherever he went in the world, he'd seek out his local Chabad house, and that's where he would go into Dublin, regardless. Except that he once came to Shropshire, which is in the backwaters of the United Kingdom, no synagogue for 100 miles. So he did the next best thing. He went into the local town church, took a seat on the back, and put on his talus and fillin, and he prayed over there. It was a Sunday. Soon people started to come in for their own services. And he, he's oblivious. He's sitting in the back, minding his own business, doing his own thing. And at a certain point in time, the priest comes to the front, sees people filling in, and he says, right, <clears throat> all those who feel that they don't really belong here right now, can you please make your way to the exit? And this guy, he's just lost in his own davening. So the priest clears his throat, and he tries a little harder, and he says, well, all non-Christians, please make your way out. Mass is about to commence. This guy, he pulls his talus even over his head even more, and he's shuffling away now, going at it full throttle. And finally, the priest can't take it anymore, and he bangs, and he yells out, and he goes, all Jews, leave now. Then the guy pauses, takes off his talus, folds it up, takes off his fill and rolls them up, puts it all in the bag, puts it under one hand, walks to the front of the church, takes off the effigy of you-know-who from the cross, puts it under his other arm and says, come on, Bobola, we got to get out of here. We're not wanted here. <laughs> even, as, even as at times we're faced with a world that says that you are not wanted here, we have to summon the courage in recognizing that true status is not determined by power and privilege, but by moral courage. It means that our challenge as a Jew is riding the rapids, regardless, and taking a message out there to the world that says simply that for whoever the world despises, for whatever the reasons, we know that God loves. We recognize the godly image in everyone, even in the weak, the powerless, the afflicted, the suffering, and we are committed always to fighting for their cause. And therefore, within that in itself, especially now in this 21st century, there is a great challenge that confronts every single one of us in terms of our own Jewish identity. Actually, I'm reminded of another story about a groom who decided to save money and he decides to go to this really down market tailor to prepare his suit for his wedding day. Only, of course, in life you get what you pay for, so the suit wasn't ready until just a few hours before his wedding. And he tries it on and he finds that the left sleeve is longer than the right sleeve. He complains, the tailor says, all right, so you just walk like this. And then he finds that when he puts on the pants, the right trouser leg, the right pants leg is longer than the left. So he says, okay, then you walk like this. 
So sure enough, two hours later, he's walking down the aisle to his wedding, and he's walking like this. And all the people are looking at him, and those who've never seen him before, and they're thinking to themselves rather loudly, Nebuch, the poor guy, is so deformed. But as Taylor, what a genius. <laughs> you see, that's the reality of Jewish history since the beginning of time. Already starting with Pharaoh in Egypt, when we endured our first oppression, distorting the image. What did Pharaoh say? They may be more, they are more and stronger than us. Right from the outset of history, those who sought to distort the image and justify the oppression, we were more and stronger than the Egyptians. And today, from the corridors of the White House through the hallways of the European Union, Israel is the pariah. Israel is the guilty one. Israel responds disproportionately. But you know what? It's who we are, it's what we represent, and it doesn't wash off. We prevailed back then, we prevailed ever since, and we will prevail today as well. So I don't really care what they say on CNN or the BBC or the New York Times. I say it's better to be a Jewish hero walking alone in one direction rather than with a crowd going in the wrong direction. As Jews, our challenge is not to be afraid to be different. They might wretchedly kidnap our boys. They might tragically kill our soldiers. They might look to terrorize us firing rocket after rocket. And we shed a tear, and we cry, and we lament, but they can never, as we have proven all through the course of history, break our spirits. Not then and not now. Because each of us knows in our own core of true Jewish self that we, the Jewish people, have, are, and always will prevail. We've proven it. We know it to be true. The only meaningful response that we as Jewish people should embrace is that we tell the world that with every ugly protest that you might hold condemning Israel whilst simultaneously throwing stones, chairs, and tables at Jews, we stand that much straighter. And that with every anti-Semitic, anti -Semitic, ignorant hashtag that you tweet, we wave our banner of Jewish pride that much higher. And with every provocation that you bring to the United Nations, hoping that maybe Israel, and let's be honest, by extension Jews, will disappear when denounced on some political platform, we are reminded once more, Ashrenu, how privileged we are to be Jewish. And that with every odious demonstration, with every violent aspersion, with every savage attack and lie fabricated, and every single abuse, we are that much prouder that we belong to a religion, to a faith, to a nation. And that we are part of a belief system where our optimism always replaces pessimism and our faith will always exceed our fears. Our ancestors, they were Jewish heroes of the past when they left Egypt all that time ago and through the course of history. We carry that legacy. We have a responsibility and we're challenged to be sure that we are the Jewish heroes of today so our children will then be able to carry that banner of Jewish pride and be the true Jewish heroes of tomorrow as well. Daily, wherever we find ourselves, in our home environment, in our workplace, or wherever else besides, we are faced with choices. Daily life challenges us with situations that come in all different shapes or forms. Indeed, the way we relate to God, to our spouses, to our children, to our neighbors, to our work colleagues, etc. And these tests, they reflect the genuineness of our commitment, the depth of our faith, and the measure of our character. And we have to recognize with every fiber of our being that beneath the layers, within each of us, lies the image of God. It's permanently there, and it is an integral part of our essence of who we are. And that therefore, just as God is eternal, everything we do has eternal consequences. And that just as God has past, present, and future rolled into one, what we do has eternal value for the past, present, and future as well. Will that eradicate the threat of anti-Semitism? You can't really use logic and explanation and hope to eliminate something that defies 
any rationale. That is just essentially founded on gross irrationality. But it will go a long way to dispel the myth and make enough of a difference to those who care enough to listen. And it will go a long way to at least fortify our own selves to confront whatever the challenge out there, to always take pride in what we represent. That is in regard to the, to the external threat. But then there's also an internal threat that we face as well. I mean, after all, what is it they say the difference between a Jew and an anti-Semite? You go over to the anti-Semites, so what do you think of Jews? Jews, I hate them, they're despicable people. And what about Cohen? Cohen is my doctor, Cohen is a mensch, I like him, he's a nice guy. And Goldberg, Goldberg, my accountant, he's also a good guy, he's an honest person, he looks after me, he's okay, they're exceptions. Go over to the Jew, what do you think about Jewish people? My brothers, my sisters, I love them. And Cohen, Cohen, that gun of, that no good nick is always sitting on my seat in shawl, I can't stand his guts. And Goldberg, Goldberg, he's even worse than him. He's wor he, I just can't stand either of them. That's the difference. First of all, when we talk about being a good Jew, what does it mean to be a good Jew? Most people typically define a good Jew as being able to rise above the parapet and survive against the odds. Isn't that, after all, what we've done through the course of Jewish history? But I think it was Dennis Prager who once put it, 3,300 years of Jewish continuity, and what, we have to live it ourselves that we, so that we can somehow preserve some small little column in the Guinness Book of Old Records as the longest serving persecuted minority in all of history. Is that really the point of it all? Is being a good Jew to be kind, to be honest and polite? No. That makes for a good person. It doesn't necessarily make for a good Jew. I mean, what makes somebody a good lawyer? Is somebody a good lawyer if he can score a goal from 30 yards out? How about if he can fix my car or he helps serve in the soup kitchen? Is he then a good lawyer? Of course not. Again, that makes him a mensch, it makes him a good person. A good lawyer is somebody who has a thorough understanding of the law and has the ability to argue and win cases. And thus, a good Jew, by definition, is understanding that you're being chosen by God with a specific mission to make this world holy, good, and godly. And to understand that as a Jew, you have a very specific divine instruction on how to carry out the mission, as we said at the outset. Those instructions are found in the Torah and have been explained and elaborated upon by the Jewish sages throughout the ages. A good Jew, therefore, is someone who does his utmost to follow those instructions and to fulfill their God-given mission. Malcolm Muggeridge was the former editor of Punch magazine, which was all about satire. And curiously, he became very religious in his later years. And in an interview, he was asked, how can you make the leap from being the king of satire and cynicism to religion? And he answered by quoting a friend of his who was a yachtsman who once told him, if you want to enjoy the freedom of the high seas, you must first become a slave to the compass. Now, an inexperienced person might simply question the need to follow a silly little compass. I want to go wherever I want to go. I want to go where I please. It's my yacht. It's my sea. Let me do what I want. But every thinking, sensible individual knows that without that navigational tool, Without the compass, you end up sailing in circles, or you become lost <laughs> altogether. If you want to enjoy the freedom of the high seas, you have to become, as it were, a slave to the compass. You know, there are many assaults on basic morality in our world today. The subjective social value system is like a pendulum that swings back and forth. What is illegal today becomes legal tomorrow. But legal and illegal is not necessarily right and wrong. Religion, on the other hand, does properly define what is right and moral. Absolute principles that determine what is acceptable. Religion in general and Torah for the Jew is the compass of life. It shows us where to go and it teaches us how to get there. And without such guidance, yes, we wander aimlessly, frustrated, restless, an ever constant pursuit of meaning. Does it cramp our lifestyle? Does it stifle our ability to express ourselves? Not any more than you would think that the compass binds the captive. 
But here's another point to consider in this regard. Because Judaism is really more than just being a religion. Religion in Hebrew is translated as das or dat, which is a term that is actually foreign to biblical literature. The Jewish people are called an am, again, a nation. We're a nation that has a covenant with God. And the one reason why we're called an am is because we are an am echad, one Jewish people. Precisely because we're not just a religion per se. A religion is a group of people that are bound together by a common belief system. And let's face it, we are Jews together in spite of our religious differences and disparity in our belief system. Because at the core, we are a nation that has a covenant with God. And therefore, every single Jew is a member of the nation who has a covenant with God, even as they may be entirely oblivious and unaware of that covenant. You know, there was a young couple that entered into the room of the Lubavitcher Rebbe for a private audience. Only it's more than just a private audience. It's a moment of soul merger between the people who are privileged to undergo that experience, just drawing whatever little bit they could from the Rebbe's soul, and it would inspire them and lift their souls that would effectively last them a lifetime. And this young couple, they came into the Rebbe's room with their two young children, an older girl and a younger son. And they told their children that they were going to receive a blessing from the Rebbe. The problem simply was this. When the Rebbe gave a blessing, always it was the case that the Rebbe would utter the blessing, like if you had a particular concern, you would ask, and the Rebbe would give you the blessing, responding in kind, asking a blessing for business. The Rebbe would give you a blessing to have success in business, health, whatever the issue was. The problem was that in this particular family, they had a custom where every Friday night, most Jewish people, certainly all, have, all Jewish people have the custom always on the eve of Yom Kippur, but some have the custom every Friday night as well, where the hand is put on the head, and then we give the child the blessing. May God make you like Menashe and Ephraim, may God make you like Sarah Rivka, Rachel Aleh, etc. And then Yivarecha Hashem, Yishmerecha, God should bless you and keep you, and so on and so forth, the famous priestly blessing. So the children, that's their understanding of what a blessing is. The hand on the head, and then the utterance of the blessing. That's not the custom in Chabad, but it is a custom that many other people have every Friday night. And that's what went on in this particular Chabad family's home every Friday night. So when the audience, when the Echidus, this private meeting with the Rebbe was over, and they were about to leave the Rebbe's room, the little boy sat down on the Rebbe's floor and he started to cry. And the Rebbe becomes immediately concerned and looks to the father and says, Pravas Vainter, why is he crying? You know, the Talmud tells us that women were given greater intuition than men. The father stood there at first, had no idea, but the mother realized, and she whispered to the father, and she said, he thinks he didn't get a blessing. Of course he got a blessing. The Rebbe gave him the blessing that he should grow up to be whatever, a chassid, a yerushimayim, God-fearing, pious, etc., etc., but to his mind, he didn't get the blessing because of the tradition that he understood in a blessing. So the mother explained that quickly to her husband and then beat a hasty retreat out of the Rebbe's room with her daughter. And then the father explained to the Rebbe why he must be crying because he assumes he didn't get a blessing. So the Rebbe smiled and looked to the father and first said, Nayim and Hagim and Chabad, you're bringing new customs into Chabad. Then the Rebbe called the little boy around to the side of his desk and put his holy hand on his head and gave him the blessing. The priestly blessing, God should bless you, God should keep you, and so on and so forth. And the reason why that story is so compelling is because that was the Rebbe acting out of the norm. You can imagine that scenario repeating itself in countless other settings, with other people in different circumstances. Sometimes it's just be a case of give the kid a candy or whatever else, smiling sweetly, and hoping the father quickly gets the annoying child out from the room. But when a child was crying, then and there, it doesn't matter that it's one o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter how many people are still waiting outside. When a Jewish child is crying for the Rebbe, that became the focal point of the world right now, to ask the burning question, Fravas Vainter. Right here, right now, the world stops with that one person question, why is this child crying? And then even more so, to do whatever is necessary, even if it's something completely unprecedented and out of the ordinary, to do what one can to be able to put paid to those child's tears. 
even if it's taking the child around and indeed going through that process with him as well. And then the Rebbe actually told the father at the end of it all that not to publicize the story because he didn't want other people to be jealous of you know, the fact that the Rebbe did this sort of thing. Which of course makes you wonder, if it wasn't supposed to be publicized, how do I know the story? Because I was that little boy. And the reason why I shared the story with you right now is because of the bigger message it conveys. There are a lot of Jewish children out there who are crying. Sometimes the tears are readily discernible, other times, indeed, most often, we don't see them. They're crying internally, in fact, so internally that all too often they themselves are oblivious to their own tears. On the surface, they look strong, they look forthright, they look determined, but somewhere deep within, at the core of their souls, they're crying out to you and to me, and they want to find their way back. They want to reconnect. They want to return home. And for us, the challenge, the mission, at that precise moment of encounter, the world has to stop, and you have but one question, only one question to ask. Why is he crying? And then do everything within your power, however out of the ordinary it might be, to put page to those tears. You know, when the prophets promise us that at the end of days, no Jew will be left behind, they're telling us categorically that one way or another, every member of the Jewish nation will, yes, find their way home. Only God is looking to you and to me to help him in that task, to hasten the process. So when an interaction comes our way, it means that that moment is meant for us, at that precise moment, to be a Rebbe, as it were, to that child. Whether three or 33, it's up to us to simply be alert to the reality that surrounds us, to be attuned to the cries, and then do whatever is necessary to put pay to those tears. You know, there's a curious statement, story, told in the Talmud about Rabbi al who was once traveling along the way when he suddenly encountered a rather homely looking individual and he simply commented and said the individual looked to him and said good morning or good afternoon and the rabbi looked at him and said how ugly is this man and the man turned around to the rabbi and he said go back to the craftsman who made me by definition you don't like the way i look you don't like the product don't blame me take it up with the manufacturer begging an obvious question what is going on in this story why does the talmud tell us the story is it really feasible to imagine and suggest that this rabbi would be so superficial, a great Talmudic sage, to just reflect on somebody's external appearance and make such a crass comment like that? I mean, could you imagine a rabbi coming into shul one day, Mrs. Silverstein, there's no easy way for me to say this, I'll just come straight out with it, you need a nose job. <laughs> By the way, if your answer to that question is yes, I don't want to know. I mean, but let's put that aside and ask yourself a different question. Can you? Imagine yourself perhaps hearing a rabbi suddenly saying, how ugly is this person religiously? How devoid is this person of any spiritual substance? How crass is this person who is disconnected from his faith? Maybe a rabbi saying that somewhere here or there, or maybe not necessarily saying it, but by nuance and innuendo. You see, what was really going on beneath the surface in this particular story is as alluded to within the commentaries of the Talmud in cryptic terms, one is that it tells us that the rabbi was coming from a place of study. And the other is that this homely looking individual was really Elijah the prophet in disguise. And the point is that clearly it would seem that the rabbi had something of a, maybe a little bit of a holier than thou attitude. You know, when you come after a long period of great Torah study, you might feel that little bit elated such that when you encounter somebody else you might, who is of a lesser stature, you might be inclined to look down upon them that little bit. And it would seem, therefore, this rabbi wasn't reflecting on this man's external appearance. On the contrary, he himself was coming from this great spiritual experience of Torah study, encountering this individual whom he defined beneath the surface, spiritually, as being somewhat ugly, null, void of any spirituality. And thus he commented and he said, how ugly is this man? But what does the man respond? He says, go back to the one who made me. Go back to my source. And what he's really effectively saying is that at the core, I too have a soul like you. At the core, I come from the same place as you do. At the core, you and I emanate 
from the same spiritual source above, from the same manufacturer, from the same God. At the core, you and I are equal. Though at first glance, a person might appear to be loathsome and despicable, who can know their true greatness and excellence in their root and source in God? Always look beyond the skin-deep ugliness and see the good and the brilliance beneath. And if more Jews throughout the world would live by that principle, then we would look like an altogether different sort of people. A few years ago, I was coming back from a solidarity trip to Israel. And I'm sitting with my wife, Hani, on the plane, and there's this other group, Jewish, uh, senior citizens, Jewish group in England called um, Jacks. And there's this elderly woman there for as part of that group sitting next to my wife and myself. And at one point, she starts telling me how wonderful her rabbi is from her community in Boreham Wood. So I just turned to her and I said, do you know the rabbi of Mill Hill, my community? And she says, Shachet, I don't like him very much. So my wife leans over, smiles sweetly and says, why not? She says, I read his regular column in the Jewish newspaper. He's very opinionated and all that. I, you know, just, and she sees me smiling from ear to ear. And she says, look, you know, I'm sorry if you have anything to do with him, but I really don't like him. And later, my wife and I went to the back of the plane to stretch our legs. And the woman was standing there with another elderly couple who must have clearly identified me. And she stops us dead in our tracks. And she says, what's your name? So my wife quickly turns around and says, I'm Chani, and then beats a hasty retreat knowing what's about to go now. <laughs> I stood there and I said, and I'm Yitzhak. And she said to me, yes, but what is your surname? And I said, Shachet. And she said, and so you are. Are you the rabbi? So hoping to make light of an otherwise very embarrassing situation, I said to her, let's just say I'm very, very closely related to him. To which she said, oh good, as long as you're not him, because I really don't like him. <laughs> you know, one thing I learned then and there is that it's very, very good therapy to sometimes drop the image and let others tell you how it is. But what's amazing is we got along so well throughout this flight. I helped her put her sweater in the overhead compartment. I helped her take it down. I showed her how to use a remote control. We exchanged a joke or two, etc. It's amazing how people are so quick to jump to conclusions and form preconceived notions, judging and passing verdict without ever really experiencing things firsthand. For the record, I'm not suggesting that she's wrong, but aren't we, to one degree or another, guilty of the same? Quick to pass judgment on other people without necessarily looking beneath the surface. Is there hope for the forlorn Jew if we just judge them and write them off as yet another statistic? Is there ever any hope if we're going to be so quick to criticize, to pounce, to define the ugliness in other people without looking beneath the surface and the inherent goodness that exists within? My father of blessed memory lectured extensively here as well, um, also on cult of missionaries around the globe. And someone once asked him the question, here in Canada years ago, they were very active, especially the Jews for Jade, the Hebrew Christians. And they used to actually build temples that were looking, that looked and replicated genuine synagogues to lure Jews in. So someone once asked them, how will I know when I'm visiting abroad whether I'm actually walking into an authentic synagogue or I'm walking into one of theirs? To which he replied, when you walk in and you're warmly greeted and embraced and given a book and a seat, then you know in all likelihood you will have wandered into one of theirs. <laughs> Except in Chabad. But when you are pretty much ignored, you have to make your own way, and the only words exchanged with you are, hey, excuse me, you're sitting on my seat, you'll know you've walked into an authentic synagogue. <laughs> this is not intended, God forbid, as an indictment on Judaism, but it expresses the point that we do have a challenge to be more warm and welcoming. The fact that people will go out of their way and spend fortunes of money just to be able to lure one Jew in, if we would just spend a fraction of that time, energy, and whatever else besides, then we would, again, change the landscape and make Judaism look altogether different. And when our rabbis ask the question, as they do, what is it that defines the Jewish people? What is it that makes us holy? From where do we derive this prince? What defines our holiness? And they answer, we learn it from a verse in the Torah that says, Umi ka'amcha Yisrael ga'echa bares, who is like your nation Israel, one nation in the land? And the obvious question is, but they ask, where do you know what defines us as being holy 
Well, that's actually, again, in this forthcoming Torah portion, where God proclaims us when giving us the Torah and defining us as a nation as a mamlechas kohen in Begot Kadosh, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. That other verse over there doesn't mention the word holy altogether. And yet the simple explanation is they weren't asking when we proclaimed as holy. They asked what defines us as holy. And the answer, who is like your nation? Go echa, one nation in the land. That's what defines our holiness, the oneness, the unity. That's what keeps us as a people. That's what defines us as a people. That is our integral challenge as a people. And I'm going to finish, therefore, with this final anecdote. Two young Jewish brothers, real troublemakers. And notwithstanding the fact they were Jewish, they were bounced from pillar to post, kicked out of every Jewish school, so the parents had no option but to simply enroll them in a strict Catholic reformatory school which had a reputation of zero tolerance for misbehavior. And the older brother is inside the dean's office whilst the younger brother is waiting outside. And he's standing there and the dean, the principal, is a big burly priest sitting by his desk. And he looks at him and he says, young man, where is God? And the boy just looks down and says nothing. And the priest says, young man, I'm talking to you and I asked you a question. Where is God? And the boy starts shifting his feet uneasily at his seat, doesn't say a word. Now the priest comes menacingly from around the side of his desk, towering over this young child and says, young man, I'm going to ask you one more time, where is God? At which point the boy jumps out of his seat, runs out of the principal's office, runs down the hall, runs bang smack into his younger brother and says, what's going on? What's going on? He says, we've got to get out of here, man. They lost God and they're blaming us. <laughs> We are living in a generation where some argue that we seem to have lost God. What is it the historian Jacob Tallman called to the Jews a community of fate? The philosopher Martin Buber called us a people with a memory. And the suggestion is that in this 21st century, the memory is fading, and the community outside Israel is withering away, and the barriers are coming down, and Jews are scrambling over. And taboos against assimilation as wilting Jewish people are breeding less, and being condemned less and less as outsiders. Today, the debate seems to be no longer between the optimists and the pessimists, but more between the more pessimistic and the less pessimistic. The challenge is for us to get a little bit more passionate about Jewish life and our role within it, about our Jewish identity and our impact on the world. You find Judaism difficult? I say to you, it's not because things are difficult that we do not dare, it's because we don't dare that they are difficult. You find that one spiritual undertaking threatening, I say to you, every shot you don't take is a guaranteed miss. You find sometimes stepping out of your comfort zone a little bit too risky, I say to you, if you don't risk anything, then effectively you are risking even more. And finally, if you find sometimes Jewish observance too tedious, too laborious, I say to you, aim for the heavens and you'll get the earth thrown in as well. Because the greatest tragedy in life it's not aiming too high and missing, it's aiming too low and reaching. You have to believe in yourself, not just as an individual, but as a Jew. Let's not waste time determining faults, focusing on the negative. That's destructive energy. It's damaging, it's a futile exercise. Our purpose, our mission, is about confronting the challenges, then moving forward, getting on with the business of building brick by brick, soul by soul, for a better, more peaceful, more illuminating tomorrow. May we all indeed enjoy success in this endeavor, and may we indeed merit the day speedily of finding ourselves in a world that is filled with peace, harmony, and everlasting salvation forevermore. Thank you. Amen.